All right, how's everybody doing? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show, talk show host, researcher, lecturer, writer, and historian. It is Thursday, May 6, 2021, and I am here with a brilliant historian and scholar. You've heard me talk about him a number of times on the African History Network show. And uh, I interviewed him a couple years ago when he was speaking here at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. We're joined by Dr. Daryl Scott from Howard University's History Department. How you doing today, brother? I'm doing doing fine. How are you doing, Michael? I'm all right, brother. I'm all right. This is it's busy, man. And I'm on the radio six days a week, you know, and doing uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered on Fridays, the panelists on Roland Martin Unfiltered. But it's good, man. And I, I'm glad to... Uh, have you here because this is a continuation of a conversation that we had at dinner about two years ago when you spoke here <laughs> and i want you to know that that wasn't two years ago now time goes by fast what, but what was it 2019 it was right before the pandemic so that's 2020 why it like it's so long ago okay but it was right. really february of 2020 it's the, one of the last times i flew so. Right, exactly. <laughs> February 2020. Right. So right, right, a scholar right. brought you here, Association right. for the Study of African American mm -hmm. Life and History, the organization that Dr. Carter G. Woodson uh, co-founded September 9th, 1915 in, in Chicago. And we know he was the head of Asala. And um, you, they, they took you to dinner after your speech. And uh, it was you, uh, myself and another historian, Jamon Jordan, who famous here in Detroit, brother, and we oh, had a long conversation. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know, good people, good people. And you know, I'm a Chicago boy, and every time I go to Detroit, it feels like it's the same city. Okay. Yeah, All yeah, right. there's so much in common. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I wanted to have this conversation, and what we're going to discuss today, uh, everybody, is uh, the 13th Amendment uh, and mass incarceration myth. OK, and 13th, 13th thirteentherism is a, is a term that Dr. <laughs> Daryl Scott has, has coined 13th thirteentherism. OK, we're going we're going to deal with this yeah. and uh, we'll talk also some about uh, the 1619 project and some of the flaws in the 1619 project, mm -hmm. because you've been you've been critical of that as well. So I, I, I want to frame this conversation. Uh, so Dr. Daryl Scott is a history professor, uh, a professor of United uh, professor of United States history at Howard University. He's a professor in the history department. He's taught there since 2003. Mm -hmm. From 2005 until 2009, he served as the department chair. Uh, he started his career at Columbia University in New York City in 1993, and, and in between, he served as du director of African American studies at the University of Florida in Gainesville, okay? Now he researches and writes on American intellectual history, nationalism in the United States, and currently convict slavery since 1615. Convict slavery since 1615? Okay, we're gonna have to, you're gonna have to give us an explanation <laughs> on that well, okay? In 1998, he won the James Raleigh, uh, James Raleigh Prize for the best book in race relations history for Contempt and Pity, Social Science and the Image of the Damaged Black Psyche, 1880 to 1996, okay? And this is a, a bad brother. Now, he also is a past president of Asala, Association for the Study of African American Life and History. If it was not for Dr. Carter G. Woodson and Asala, we would not have African American History Month, Black History Month, which started out as Negro History Week in 1926. We wouldn't have okay. black studies. Say again? We wouldn't have black studies. We wouldn't have black studies if it was not for Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Right. And, and, and Woodson is very, very much, I think, underrated. I think he's very much underrated and underappreciated. So he has a whole list of accomplishments as well. Uh, give people your website. They can uh, go to your website uh, and find out more also. www.darylmichaelscott.com, one word. Okay, darylmichaelscott.com. And it's Daryl with one R. DarylMichaelScott.com, yeah. and not okay. that guy, not that guy at Ohio, not that guy. Exactly, not that, not that <laughs> the Daryl Scott. Exactly, exactly. So I, I wanted to have this conversation uh, because this evolved out of uh, the dinner that we had back in mm -hmm. February 2020, and you and I had a conversation during dinner, um, 
and we discussed the myth of the 13th Amendment of 1865, ratified December 6, 1865, to the U.S. Constitution, and the myth that the 13th Amendment re-enslaved the, the former slaves, okay? You mm -hmm. talked about the uh, documentary 13th by Ava DuVernay, and I, I remember when the, I saw the documentary twice, and mm -hmm. um, when I saw the documentary right around that time, mm -hmm. I was doing research on a, um, a lecture dealing with the history of the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And I had, um, I had done research on uh, the war on drugs before. Mm -hmm. And when I, uh, when I dealt with, um, when I was doing this research, uh, I kept coming up with this same question over and over again. Now I heard people say, the 13th Amendment re-enslaved black people and uh, mm -hmm. it said mm -hmm. that they were free and less duly convicted of a crime. And I'm going to pull up the actual text of the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment here in mm -hmm. just a second. And the question, when I go through and study the chronology of the history from 1865 mm -hmm. to the beginning of the war on drugs, June 17th, 1971, under Richard Nixon, mm -hmm. that's 106 years. I kept coming back to the same question. If the 13th Amendment was created to re-enslave us and it created mass incarceration. Why did it take 106 years for mass incarceration to start? Exactly. I kept coming back to that same question over and over again. It's a huge question. And, and, and it's, you would think, now, I started teaching a course around this. Mm -hmm. And one of the impressions that the movie creates, and, and again, this doesn't start with the, with the, with the documentary, Correct. One of the impressions that the documentary creates is that everybody's re-enslaved. Right. And my students come to class thinking, because they've all seen the documentary. Right. They come to class thinking that by 1870, 1880, the way they roll this out, that most of the ex-slaves had been re-enslaved. Okay. <laughs> and, they, and, they, and, and, some pe and some of them go as high as 90% thinking that 90% of them had been re-enslaved. Okay. Wow. So that's the impression that is created when you say that slavery didn't end, it evolved. Mm -hmm. But when the reality, when you look at the reality, is that in the late 19th century, never 1% of the free people were re-enslaved. Never 1%. It was more like point to 5%, mm -hmm. okay? So it's never re-enslavement at all. The number is so out of sync that that is the biggest misimpression. And so when you start teaching about the 13th Amendment and, and incarceration, the first thing that pops to be is that they have to confront the fact that 99% of their ancestors in the late 19th century were never incarcerated okay okay <laughs> okay <laughs> so yep yep even though we disproportionately in many states even though we were disproportionately well, well, this made is, up a percentage of the incarcerated right, rate but here, the majority of us were not so, incarcerated now here is the truest statement of all okay okay and let's get this out here because you know some people get confused and start thinking if i disagree with this i must be politically a conservative okay look I just believe the truth may not set you free, but a lie certainly won't. All okay. Right? <laughs> now, when you start going back and looking at incarceration rates, mm -hmm. black people have always been disproportionately incarcerated. Right. So the meaning of racism, the import of racism and incarceration is that black people are always disproportionately incarcerated. So when the prisons start developing in the early 19th century, mm -hmm. we're always there disproportionately. Now, some of the 13thers would like to say, well, the prisons were made for white folks. Yeah, they were, but they did just fine for black folks, if right. you will. Right. So right. that, in, for instance, in New York State, 
Black people were something like 2% of the population in the antebellum period. Black women were 40% of the incarcerated people. Right. Okay, 40%. So 2% of the population produced 40% of the female prisoners. So that tells you that that is mad disproportionate incarceration. Now, this is before the 13th Amendment. And who were these people? These were free black people. And so the state of freedom for black people has always been one of disproportionate incarceration. Right. Nothing to do with the 13th. Before the 13th, we're disproportionately incarcerated. After the 13th, we're disproportionately incarcerated, but never never were we mass incarcerated in the 19th century. And the term mass does not even come into the conversation until the late 20th century. And when people create language, they typically create language for a purpose, okay? They don't just come up with it for no reason. They typically are trying to make sense of something. And what everyone was trying to make sense of by the 1970s, was the fact that incarceration was getting out of control. And so we went from being disproportionately incarcerated in a society where roughly 200,000 people were being incarcerated to being disproportionately incarcerated in a system of mass incarceration so that we were six or seven times more likely to be incarcerated and over a million of us incarcerated OK, and that number approaching one point five percent incarcerated in the federal pens. I mean, I'm only talking about the federal system. OK, okay. and disproportionately incarcerated in, in that system. So the history is one of consistent disproportionate incarceration. And why? Because of racism. Right. Now, why anybody hauls the 13th Amendment into this conversation? I don't know. I mean, that, but, that, you know, but it's, it's like I know why. And, you know, I, I mean, I say why, because it's a it's a wonderful conspiracy theory. Right. So let me do this. Let me pull up. Uh, I have the text of the 13th Amendment here and I encourage people to go to archives.gov which is the uh, official website of the National Archives, archives.gov. Mm -hmm. You can also go to loc.gov, which is, which is the Library of Congress website, loc.gov. And you can read the entire U.S. Constitution. Uh, you can read the uh, 13th Amendment. You can read all the amendments, the 27 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. Uh, so I'm going to pull down the pull this down also the uh chiron down there so if we look at the 13th amendment the 13th amendment is two sections first section section one neither slavery nor, inv nor involuntary servitude except as punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the united states or any place subject to their jurisdiction okay so people focus in on uh, the party shall, or whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall, okay, and they focus on that and say that's a loophole. They say it's a loophole, okay? I've heard well-known African-American historians say this, highly respected African-American historians, Af African Senate historians, I've heard say this, okay? Section two, some friends of mine, okay, I've heard say this. A lot of my friends, I got some former students out here saying this. <laughs> yep. Now, Section two says Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. OK, now the 13th Amendment was uh, passed by Congress January 31st, 1865. It was ratified December 6, 1865 and adopted December 18th, 1865. OK, now, Dr. Daryl Scott, um, when I had a conversation with you and historian Jamon Jordan, we we would talk, man, we talked for two hours at dinner. Yeah. You talked about you talked about the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Right. And how that's crucial to understanding the 13th Amendment of 1865. Could you could you explain the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, please? Yeah, but let me first say something. Okay, go ahead. This clause mm -hmm. is dealing with up. Two kinds, let's talk about two kinds of slavery. Okay. And, and let's just look at the language for a second. Okay. 
All right, involuntary servitude. Mm -hmm. I have not found in any document the phrase involuntary servitude prior to 1785 when Thomas Jefferson and a committee used the phrase to talk about Western expansion in general. Mm -hmm. That bill did not pass. Two years okay. later, the Northwest Ordinance passed, but it has this phrase involuntary servitude. And it also has the phrase slavery, except as punishment for a crime. Now, one thing I want to say is let's talk about two different kinds of slavery. Okay. Let's talk about chattel slavery. And let's talk about slavery, convict slavery. Okay. okay? Now, chattel slavery is when you become property and you are owned for your life and it is intergenerational, which means your status gets passed on through your mother to your children. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's intergenerational chattel slavery when you're treated like personal property. Convict slavery is when you are a convict. The state has the claim, the right and the power to take your labor without compensation, but it's typically for a term. Typically okay. for a term. Now, why is there redundancy in this clause? It says involuntary servitude or slavery. And it's precisely because there was nothing a white man can do in British North America and then in the United States to ever become chattel slavery, a chattel slave. Mm -hmm. Nothing they could ever do. And the British were notorious for denying that anybody white had ever been a slave. Other whites in Europe sometimes admitted that whites were slaves. Okay. Okay. Right, right, right. But the British always denied. So always note when you see involuntary servitude sitting in this clause, Thomas Jefferson and company is talking about white folks. And when you see slavery, it's referred to slave, they're talking about black folks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're talking about both at once white people and black people. Now, in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, they were talking of, they were taking land from existing states. And in that land, they were saying there would be no chattel slavery. That is what the Northwest Ordinance was created to do, to prevent any more chattel slavery in those states. And those states are well, Wisconsin today, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, the old Northwest as they call it. And so they were eliminating chattel slavery. Okay, the so, this, so this is what the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was doing. That is what it's attempting to do in okay. chattel slavery, mm -hmm. because there were slaves, chattel, in these places. Now, when this ordinance was created, there were virtually no prisons in America. Right. And so in frontier America, you didn't have prisons. So what did you do? When someone broke a crime, you basically had choices of leasing them out to people, selling them out for a term. You could whip them, cut off their ears, brand them, or put them to death. Mm -hmm. So when this ordinance was created, it was created in an age in a land where there really were no prisons. Okay, so this ordinance is for how to deal with people who broke the law on one hand, the white ones, involuntary servants, the black ones, slaves. So this was about that. It was about, and by the way, most of the time we're talking about free blacks. So we're talking about what to do with a free black who broke the law. You could make them slaves for a term, not slaves for life, slaves for a term, okay. not their children. So I'm trying right. to break down because this long history starts right there in a different world. It starts in a different world. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Jefferson wants to end chattel slavery. 
Now, people don't want to deal with this. He wants to end chattel slavery and he wants to end the presence of black people in America. He doesn't want black people in America. Right. He doesn't want slavery and he doesn't want black people in America. So if you want to call this clause something, this is a white nationalist clause. This is a Richard Spencer kind of clause that <laughs> says that this is going to be an ethno racial state without black people. Because we're going to kill chattel slavery. And we're going to prevent free blacks from going to the, the, in, to the Northwest by getting slavery, ship them all abroad if you can. But what we're going to do in the meantime, in between time, is if they break a law, they will be sold for a term. This is important. Why? Because at this moment in history, Black people in Maryland were being, who were free, were being sold back into slavery when they broke a law because they didn't have prisons. Okay? And you could sell a free black into slavery for a term of years. Now, white people could be sold too. And in colonial America, white people were sold to other white people. Some right. white people were sold to black people, but right. they were never slaves. This they were the servitude. Servant because right. they broke a law. Okay, so the whole notion then, remember now, when you, when you deal with that, mm -hmm. okay? So you, when, you, when you say white people, you know, involuntary servants, that's white people playing skull games with white people, <laughs> okay? And when black people buy this kind of stuff, they're buying into the skull game. All right. So white people. OK, you, you know, anyway, so white people are having mental sex with white people. OK, I want to make it clear to you. Okay? Go ahead. They're basically make it plain. Like Malcolm you, you said, make it plain. I can sell you right next to the black guy mm -hmm. and I can sell you for 10 years to a black guy. Right. OK. Right. But you're not a slave. But that free black, he's a slave. And we're doing this because we don't have prisons. Nobody's come along with prisons. And our choices are few. And we kill you for a lot of things. We got a hundred and something laws for which we will put you to death. So the prison is reform. So the prison is a system of reform where we're going to reduce the number of capital offenses, capital meaning we put you to death, right? We're going to reduce the number of capital offenses to a few, and we're going to spare your life and reform you, okay? So this is before all that comes along when this clause is written. The practical effect of this clause as time goes by, increasingly, it's proven effective in doing one thing. Okay, okay. Killing chattel slavery. Wherever this clause is put in a constitution in the United States, and it's put in every constitution for a free state, every free state gets this clause, okay? Congress puts it in every free state constitution. So every new state has it that's free. Old states don't have it. Virginia doesn't have it. Delaware doesn't have it. Okay. Those original 13 don't have it. Michigan had it. Okay. Ohio had it. Oregon had it. Iowa had it. California had it. So all the free states got this clause and it is effective in doing what it's supposed to do. Kill chattel slavery. And all the way up to the Civil War, there were free blacks and white folks who were sold on the auction block when they committed crimes in these states. All the way up to the Civil War. 1861. Well, actually, I'm sorry. Let me be precise about this because it gets interesting. Okay. Okay. Because this gets to the other side of this story. Yeah, I'm getting some yeah, feedback. Getting some feedback. Okay, well, let's get some feedback because I'm running for, for enough of it for now. Okay, no, no, no. I, no I mean, oh, 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 you mean yeah. some static? Okay, so, yeah. so, so, no, no, so, no. I, I turned on your volume a little bit. Check something. I want to make sure I don't have too, uh, 
I want to make sure I don't have two browsers open so I don't hear myself. Hold on just a second. Okay. All right. That sounds better. Okay. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead and continue. Dr. Okay. Dr. Scott. And so then the people who create the 13th Amendment, okay, mm -hmm. not the clause, but the, the amendment in which they basically take the Northwest Ordinance, right? Mm -hmm. The people who create this clause, this has been around 60 something years by the time the 13th Amendment is drafted. Okay. And it's what we call boilerplate, all right? And right. you know, and a lot of people say, well, it's boilerplate, that means people don't think about it. Now, let me tell you what boilerplate is. I happen to have been a legal clerk, never a lawyer, a legal clerk in the army. And we did a lot of stuff with boilerplate. You take language, that exists and you charge people with existing language, right? So, so it's like a contract that is the same contract you use every time. Why do you use the same contract every time with all that boilerplate language? It's because it's tried and proven, right? okay? Right. Boilerplate is tried and proven. And so when somebody puts a boilerplate in you, uh, in, you in legal terms, it basically, they got you. Okay, this has been this this thing has been through everything. This charge that they're putting you on, it's been to the court, it's been argued about, people have appealed it, <laughs> they have done everything. This thing right. works. It sets okay. a precedence. It sets it's, a precedence. It, yeah, it's it, yeah, and I mean, and it's got a track record. <laughs> okay, I just want to be clear. Because right. wherever they put that clause, they end it chattel slavery. And they wanted to do one thing. No, they weren't trying to get rid of prisons, nor were they trying to get rid of convict slavery. They were trying to get rid of chattel slavery. Okay? Okay, okay. Now, the abolitionists, some of them were for prisons because they were reformers. Okay? But here's what they didn't want, and here's what they didn't know. Charles Sumner. Everybody points to Charles Sumner in the hero in the 13th of narrative because Charles Sumner said we shouldn't use this language. But let's be clear about one thing. Charles Sumner was for prison. He was not against prisons and he was not against prison labor. OK, all the prisons, white and black, would labor. So he was for all that. But nobody he didn't know that free blacks were being sold on an auction block, okay? He didn't know that in Maryland, they were still selling people. In Delaware, they were still selling people. He didn't know they were still selling white people. These are not things that they necessarily knew, everybody knew. In 1840, right, right. for instance, when Harrison was running for president, he got accused of selling white people into slavery. And they would call it slavery when they were trying to be pejorative. So white people who were being sold into involuntary servitude when they got to politics were saying that they were saying they were being sold into slavery. And yes, they were. They were being sold into a slavery in four term of years. So the 13th Amendment, that clause was supposed to kill everything, but the people in the North didn't get it. But they weren't trying to kill Chattel slave, but they were trying to kill, and we'll find, and we'll know in a second. They were trying to kill immediately the idea that you could sell a black person. So, in 1866, one year after the passage of the 13th Amendment in Maryland, which was forced to have this clause, Maryland, as you know, occupied this borderland that the North was not going to let go into the Confederacy, and so they dealt with Maryland very sternly, and they forced this amendment, this clause into their constitution. So they made Maryland take it. So one of these Southern leaning, Confederate leaning judges, okay, in Anne Arundel County down the road, he basically said, I'm try this. I'm going to take these old laws that govern free blacks. Right. Right. And I'm going to sell some black people on the, on, on the courthouse steps, auction them off. And it was a test case. You can tell us a test case because he sold three or four people. And one of the people being sold was a black guy who bought himself. OK, so <laughs> brother got on the courthouse step and they say, you know, look to the highest bidder. And brother started bidding and he bought himself for thirty dollars. OK, and so he, he was sold to himself. As a slave for a term. Oh, you say, OK, so the 13th Amendment did have a loophole. 
boy, Charles Sumner didn't know this was about to happen. He went off. And so did the rest of the radical Republicans. This is how, partly how you get the 13th, I mean, excuse me, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. Right. The two things that give you the, the Civil Rights Act, this behavior right here and the black codes, which we'll get back to. Okay. So you get these two things that give you the 1866. Salmon P. Chase, who's now on the Supreme Court, who was in Lincoln's cabinet. Chase, look here. Chase went off. He ruled that you can't sell people like this. So the loophole was shut down immediately. Hmm. Immediately. It was shut down before anybody created, guess what? Convict leasing. Before so when you get all this 13th theorism that this loophole is how you get convict slavery or how you get right. uh, convict leasing, oh, no. Oh, no. This loophole was shut down within a year. Okay? The Freedmen's Bureau shut down that loophole in right, Virginia. Right. In Virginia, they, they were trying to sell black people too on the courthouse steps. Virginia, the Freedmen's Bureau said no. Now, the point here is what was created to end chattel slavery was also going to end anything that smacked of slavery, which usually means to most of us, selling people to a private entity, okay? okay. So selling people to a private okay. entity. And so they said, no, you know, we're not gonna have any of this. Now convict leasing is different and convict leasing comes along and it is, it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't start after the 13th Amendment it starts before the 13th Amendment. Right. In Alabama, okay. right? I think it's in the 1840s. Uh, it, it, it starts in Louisiana. Louisiana. But I just, and, and here's something the historians didn't know. Mm -hmm. It also existed in Virginia in the 1850s. So this ain't no long ago, far away stuff. Convict right, right. leasing existed. And, and in Virginia's case, it's kind of interesting because, it, well, in both cases, it's interesting because. Convict leasing took place in the South where black people were typically sold to a contractor, a lot leased, I should say, to a contractor. Okay. And there's, you know, by the way, you buy the lease, you bid on the lease, and sometimes you're literally looking at the people you're about to lease. So it smacks in certain ways of slavery. Okay. Because you can see that sometimes you literally the people go in and say, I want to I want to review these slaves and, and, and make sure that they're worth buying. And, and right. white people, too, white and black. They're looking them over, looking them in their mouth and all this kind of stuff sometimes. Right. And so they want to make sure that what they're leasing is worth the lease. But in Louisiana and in Virginia, the tendency is to have the white folks being leased out and working in the prisons and the black folks being leased out to work on the hard labor. Now, this is very consistent with the fact that white people weren't supposed to do hard labor in the South, right? You know, under slavery. So this is consistent with that. And so the first guys of convict leasing in the South made a differentiation once again between black and white and it's racist and discriminatory. Both are being leased out in both of these states. Both are being made to work in both of these states. And in our common parlance that I think trivializes everything, there's white privilege for the white convicts. Okay. okay, okay. You know, in, in that language, you know, that language of privilege. But anyway, I don't get in that to that today. But anyway, but to, so that people understand that there was a two tiered system of convict leasing. After the war, whites still have some privilege, but you know what? Whites increasingly find themselves in convict leasing doing a lot of the work that black people do. It's no automatic free walk to a, a, a smooth deal, right? In other words, oftentimes they were doing the same kind of back breaking and you perhaps will die labor, all right? But they still tended to be, hey, just like today, there's still privilege in the prisons on who gets what job. OK, right. so there's always that in the system. The racism is the universal, my, my friend. It's the universal. But what is there? So convict leasing comes along 
despite the 13th Amendment, because the 13th Amendment doesn't have any problem with hard labor for convicts. None. Zero problem. Okay? Okay, okay. It ain't nothing new. The 13th Amendment does not create convict slavery. It does not. It goes all the way back to 1615. So it's nothing okay. new. There's 250 years of this. There's 200 years of convict slavery before the 13th Amendment. Okay, <laughs> you get me? It's right, 200. Right. In fact, 250. So roughly 1615 to 1865, white people could be sold as involuntary servants to other people. So, 250 so, so, years of it. So we know about the convict, we know about the indentured service. Okay. okay. Are you hearing me twice on your end? I'm, no, I'm not going to hear you twice. Okay. Okay. Maybe it's just feedback on my end. And, and those watching, uh, let me know if you're hearing me twice. If not, then the audio will come out okay then. Uh, so we know, and, and I think it's important. I, I held up this book here. This is um, Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. Chapter two of uh, Before the Mayflower really helps to lay out this chronology of history and it deals with uh, uh, white people being put into involuntary servitude. It talks about uh, some uh, free blacks who are going to own, uh, I'm sorry, it, it talks about um, white people being put into indigenous servitude, I should say, indigenous servitude. Oh, it talks, oh, go ahead. But let me, let me clarify something. Okay. All right. Sorry. Historians have been very sloppy. Okay. And sometimes I think they're sloppy with a purpose. Okay. Okay. There's a way that we want to call everybody an indentured servant. Okay. Okay. So, and we get this impression that most that indentured servants came voluntarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. All right. Not everybody came involved voluntarily. And it's really striking how we refuse to call a slave a slave. All right. Okay. So, but along with the volunteers who had their money to pay for their ship to the world, new world. See, if you had your money, okay, you just got a ride over and you went about your business. If you didn't, if you volunteered, but you didn't have enough money, okay. Someone would pay your way over, and you were still a volunteer, and you were leased out to somebody as a servant, usually from for about seven years. Okay, that's voluntary. Okay, servitude. That's voluntary servitude, and they were called indentured servants. Now, indentured, an indenture is a contract. OK, it's just a contract term for a contract. And so you say, I'll sign right here and I'll do some time to get over there so I can have a new new life. Well, some of the right. white folks who came did not come voluntarily. They came because they were convicted of a crime, often a petty crime. In England, and some didn't commit any crime. OK, they right. were kidnapped and they used to call it spirited away okay and later on when the after the american revolution when the british started snatching asians and bringing them to the new world they call it shanghai okay and so then you could be spirited away you could be kidnapped against your will kidnapped is against your will and put on a boat and next thing you know several months later you you in the Okay, right. okay. And now what happens? They sell you. You're no volunteer, you're sold. But the other way, and so by the way, if you didn't volunteer and they're taking your labor, my friend, I don't care if they call you an involuntary servant, you're a slave. You're working for free without compensation against your will for a term of years. Okay, now, the reason I bring this up, because, again, I'm going to even argue with my boy Woodson behind me. Okay. It's because when you get these Africans, you know, a lot. I was taught and believed until I started doing this project that those first Africans were indentured. Right. Here, 
check this. It's just very simple. Who are you listening to about this? If somebody snatched you from Africa mm -hmm. and you didn't speak English, they sold you when they put you on the ship. When you got here, they sold you again. Right. Now, you didn't sign a contract. You didn't speak English. You couldn't consent to a contract. And, 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 they, and so what contract? How do you call me an indentured servant when I didn't sign a contract? Okay? So you, you're not an indentured servant. You are working against your will without compensation. My friend, you're a slave. Mm -hmm. I don't care what they put in the law book. I don't care what the colony wrote down. And by the way, nobody has ever seen what the colony wrote down. Nobody's ever seen one of these black people's indentures. No one's ever seen one, all right? Okay, so we are speculating and we are inferring from cases that come to the court. But beyond inferring, I'm gonna say, even if somebody did treat you like an indenture, that doesn't make you an indenture. You didn't sign an indenture. You didn't volunteer nothing. They took your labor. They took you twice. They took you from your native land. They put you on a boat. So you're a slave. So those first Africans were slaves, right? Alongside some white folks who were convicted. Because in England, by the way, they were letting some convicts in England come over rather than what? Putting them to death. So the king was vicious. The king would say, you stole something, you burglarized something. Oh, that's a capital offense. Off with his head, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Then, this is before the prison. This is before all this great reform. This is before the full enlightenment and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay, so they're putting these people to death. Then comes grace from the Lord, if you will, the king, which is to say, we're going to send you over here for 20 years. Okay, to the colonies. Uh-huh. Oh, you got another choice. Right. You, We could take your head right now. Okay? So that choice is not a choice. That basically is you are being sent into involuntary servitude, which is what? Against your will, which is slavery. You're going to work for 20 years against your will, okay? Because you committed a crime. It could be vagrancy, which means you could be no, no, no way to show that you had income, and they could just snatch you up and say, hey, hey, we're going to send you over here. And then you could be sent over by kidnapping, and they can still give you 20 years, so my right, point to right. you is that they got white folks right beside these black folks in early Virginia and Maryland who are nothing but slaves convicted and treated like convicts, sometimes just stolen, and, and they're going to spend some years, okay, working for somebody without recompense. Right. Okay, so that's why I use the term convicted convict slave. And so convict slavery is an institution that's 250 years old when the 13th Amendment comes. Okay. It started and, nothing. And and uh, I, I know chapter two of Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr., he lays out some of this history. Mm -hmm. And um, he did, this is, uh, this is before chattel slavery evolves in like the yeah, 60s. that's right. We don't even have... We don't even fully have chattel slavery, but here's the truth about this. Now, you know, again, mm -hmm. I'm not, I, you know, I'm one of these historians. I believe I don't care about the politics of history. Right. Okay. I really, I really want the cars to fall where they, where they may. Because right. I, the I truth. really, I think the highest expression of intellect is solving problems. All right. And how to get out of a mess. Okay. Right. You're in a mess. How do I get out? And the only way you get out of a mess is to, to tell the truth to yourself, right? Deal with the truth. All right. And so when, when, when you start looking at the development of chattel slavery, look, from the very beginning, there's chattel slavery in North America, as we know, the Spanish. And, and by the way, the Puritans are not tripping about stuff like this. OK, the Puritans have no problem putting Native Americans in slavery. Mm -hmm. OK, they don't have they don't have a problem with this. 
Okay. And, and so what everybody's scared of, everybody's scared of what the king will say. So they get into the business of chattel slavery before the law, but nobody wants to be honest about it because the king may very well say that he doesn't want slavery. He basically says there's no slavery in his realm. Now they start dealing with black folks as slavery and as slaves, and they, they start dealing with white folks, I mean, excuse me, Native Americans as slaves early on. And other European countries do it too. And these people are occupying the same world. They're not strangers to these institutions of the institution of chattel slavery. And so many people probably bought those first 20 Africans and said to themselves, you'll never be, you'll never be free. Okay. And subsequent ships that came along, virtually nobody was, was free. Right? <laughs> In other words, let me just tell you that, you know, so this, there's this very short window in which right. black people were, had a chance to get free, at, you know, when they came over here, and and so then what you got in the in the seventeenth century, uh, well before you know we like to say that plantation slavery starts around about seventeen oh five, but what you have by the time you get into the sixteen thirties, you got people who were being treated as chattel in Virginia and Maryland, okay. Mm -hmm even though these cases don't start busting up to the courts until the 1640s and so forth, okay? Right. So don't think that there's no chattel slavery until then. It's a very short window. So right. you're really talking about something like 10 to 15 years, okay? Mm -hmm. This is a period of time shorter than 9-11 to now, right? <laughs> so, right, right. So, so you, you have the uh, treatment of African people as chattel slaves before you have the codified slave laws actually in place. absolutely absolutely yeah yeah absolutely. and then you and then you look at um massachusetts is going to be the first uh colony to have codified slave laws in 1641 but this is before the colonies start having the chattel slavery codified the laws in the 1660s with Virginia yeah, and Maryland. Absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. So in other words, sometimes, you know, look, there's a way in which we can make too much of laws and too mm -hmm. little of laws, mm -hmm. because what we're really looking for is what was going on on the ground. Right. Okay. That's what we're really trying to find out. And, and the law is just one way to find out what was going on. Sure. Or, and sometimes it's not a good guide for what's going on, okay? Sometimes the laws can tell you how things are. You get on the ground and you know, for instance, you have laws against intermarriage and all this, and you can look around and find people who, you know, married sometimes. I mean, so you can see things that just are not with the law because oftentimes the question is how are the laws being enforced? And so there's practice, there's law, and sometimes there's discrepancies between the two. And what a good scholar does is that you look at practice and law and you discuss these kind of things as openly and with as much detail as you can so that people get a sense of what was going on. Right, right, exactly. Um, you were quoted in the article from USA Today back uh, from February 8th, 2019. 1619, 400 years ago, a ship arrived in Virginia bearing human cargo. Mm -hmm. And you talked some about uh, what you just mentioned here. We're going to come back to the Northwest Ordinance just By a minute way, in you know South Carolina. But I'm saying, yeah, yeah, you changed your mind. That's what I was coming that's to. Right. That's uh, right. And it's not that the history changed. And I have the article up here. That's right. I, I, I talk about this and, and, I, and I have thousands and thousands of articles I, I teach from, from this. But um, it's something very important in here. I'm going to scroll down to this. You talked about so for, for just so people understand, it's a it's a tricky history dealing with that 20 and odd Africans. And the reason why it's a tricky history is because they are captured from um, what's present day Angola. Mm -hmm. They are put on a Portuguese slave ship called the San Juan Batista. It's about mm -hmm. 350 of them. Mm -hmm. The San Juan Batista is going to be hijacked by English pirates mm -hmm. around Veracruz, Mexico. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going to take about 50 to 60 of these Africans off the San Juan Batista, put them on two English pirate ships, the White Line and the Treasurer. Mm -hmm. The White Line and the Treasurer come into Point Comfort in Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, and from my research, it wasn't Jamestown, Virginia. It's actually like present day Hampton, Virginia. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, but they come in a point comfort. And then August 2016, 19, 20 and odd Africans on the white lion are going to be exchanged for food and water and supplies. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now when at 1619, mm-hmm. they don't have codified slave laws Not in these any of the 13 colonies. Right. And they don't even have a Virginia assembly, right? Yeah, okay. And and then from my research, they're gonna be now they're they're captured. They're they're mm-hmm. captured by the Portuguese. Right. It's against their will. Exactly. They're put, it is put they're put into <laughs> But for, for my research, they're put into in in um, Virginia. They're put into a form of say involuntary indentured servitude because well, they're going to be released after it, a number of years. Okay, now you but just it's against their sp- will. Go ahead. Yeah, go that's ahead. right. Well, you've heard my spiel, and you can go see ahead. again. I historians change their mind. Mm-hmm. Okay, when I first dealt with this issue mm-hmm. uh, years ago, I, right, I right. up until. 2019, right? I had the position that they were indentured servants. That's what I was taught. By the way, that's what Carter G. Woodson argues. Okay. okay. So we've been this has been argued for over a hundred something years by scholars that they were indentured servants, right? Now you uprightly point out that they're involuntary indentured servants. But let me suggest this to you. Sure. There is a concept that existed. Time immemorial of slavery for a term of years, slavery for a term of years, all right? If you are being held against your will today and being forced to work, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in Africa or whether it's in Asia, we call that slavery. It's called slavery because you are being forced to work against your will without compensation. Now, we can say it's involuntary servitude, or we can say that is slavery, and oftentimes it's for a set of years, for a term of years. So some of these people, and this is how I put it now, were treated like slaves for a term. Mm -hmm. Some of them were treated like chattel from day one, in a sense that nobody intended to let them go. See, we don't know for certain what their status was and what people's intentions were, but okay. we it, it plays itself out fairly quickly. So by 19, look, by 1826, right? If they're getting the seven year treatment, right? It's over. They, 1826 be, or 1626? 1726. 1726. They, they, should, they should be gone. They should be on their way, right? right? They should be free to go. I mean, do whatever you want to. It's been real. You did your seven years. We know that's not the case. Mm-hmm. So we know that some people are being treated differently. And it's probably probable that a lot of these white folks with, who were holding them were trying to hold them permanently. They right. just didn't know what to tell the king because it, it was unclear what the king was saying. So if I look. It's speculative, but I'm going to say this. If I was holding you, I wouldn't be running around up a Marlboro where I live telling people I got you in my basement because I know that's illegal. But if it was uncertain, I still wouldn't tell anybody. You you follow me? I wouldn't tell anybody any of this. And that's what's going on in some of these places. They don't like we don't want to necessarily alert the king to any of this. Mm -hmm. But they know it's happening elsewhere. Right. And, and, and at the same time, you have a uh, you have different things taking place at the same time when you go in uh, up until the 1660s. But even after that, because you're going in the various colonies, you're going to have free African-Americans who can vote and own property. OK, and then that's mm-hmm. going to we're going to see that phased out and those rights taken away from them. As and, well. and, and by the way, some of this doesn't it doesn't take long. I mean, everybody knows. Mm-hmm. That these free Africans are being discriminated against. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. Anthony Johnson, the person, the first black slaveholder, the first black person we know who who got his freedom, also ended up being a black slaveholder. Well, we also know that he, <laughs> when he died, they took his property from his exactly. family. Exactly, they I took mean, his property so, from the family. Yep. 
I mean, this this this, this was a, like a, a tenuous existence for these free people. But, but you know, mm-hmm. later called free people of color, but he called himself an African. This was a tenuous existence for these folks, right? And, yeah. and so they could always fall. And like I say, when they broke laws, they were treated as slaves for a term. See, that's what it became. They stole into slavery, and if they broke too many laws, they'll sell them for life, chattel, as chattel. Okay. Now, when you said they, who is the they you referring with? If they broke too many laws, who's the they you referring to? If free blacks broke laws. Oh, free blacks. Okay, right, right. If free blacks broke the laws, like you know, the descendants of of the the, the twenty odd, right? Mm-hmm, right. If, if, if the, those who got free, if they broke laws in Virginia, they could be sold on the blocks. OK, just like the white people who would be would be so, too. But what I'm saying is that that practice never ends for them until 1865. Right. OK, for white folks, they'll still sell them. They, by the way, in Virginia, they pretty much stopped selling white people uh, as involuntary servants, quote unquote, involuntary servants around about the time of the revolution. Okay. 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 1775, right, yeah, right, right around, around that time. About that time, right. You know, and, and again, I, I haven't been to every courthouse down there to see how that shook out really big, but I'm sure it was somebody sold. <laughs> mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, so let me follow up and, and we'll be here for a few more minutes. Uh, you have, you have a l- little more time? Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. No problem. Uh, and for those just tuning in, I'm Michael M. Hotel. Uh, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. We're speaking with Dr. Daryl Scott, who's a history professor in the history department at Howard University. We're talking about the 13th Amendment and mass incarceration myth, the myth that the 13th Amendment led to mass incarceration or created mass incarceration, a loophole in the 13th Amendment that re-enslaved the former slaves, the free African-Americans. And uh, he has coined the term 13thism, 13thism. Uh, he teaches a history class at, at Howard University uh, called From Slavery to Mass Incarceration. Is, is, is that's the name of the class? Right, right. Right. And he talks about because we were Facebook friends mm-hmm. and he oftentimes point, he oftentimes <laughs> posts about uh, the, 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 the students coming into the class and they seen. Ava DuVernay's movie Thirteenth, and they think that the Thirteenth Amendment re-enslaved African Americans, and he has to go through this whole deprogramming process. Okay, but <laughs> talk by, about that. But, but by the way, it's this is increasingly a problem. Mm-hmm. This is increasingly a problem across a whole bunch of topics. Mm-hmm. You know, we're going to talk a little bit. I know about sixteen ninth the New 16, York sixteen nineteen project. Yep, project. Uh, mm-hmm. Buck breaking. Is about to come out. This is, you know, this is about to be one that will show up on campus. You know, all this stuff that people say uh, practicing. I, you know, look, Jamon Jordan, as you know, is a, is a dear friend of mine. I respect right. him as a scholar. He doesn't teach at a university. He doesn't come with a PhD, but he does real history. OK. Yeah. And we historians often debate. We don't agree on anything except we're going to use evidence. And, right. we're gonna, we, and we're going to be rigorous in our use of evidence and we're going to argue stuff. OK, boom. And we don't sell stuff that we can't prove. Mm-hmm. And we don't see the past as a place where you find lies and myths that you can use to justify any and everything you want to happen in the world. OK, so so there's a kind of rules of the road. But increasingly, we live in an age where history is becoming propaganda and the white folks ain't the only propagandists. Okay. Okay. Historically, they were the propagandists and Woodson basically spent his life trying to dispel the lies told about us. Now we're lying on ourselves, Mm -hmm. increasingly lying on ourselves. Sometimes it's very well intentioned stuff. Okay. I mean, the 13th there's are really people who want to end mass incarceration. I'm not against their goal. I'm for their goal. I want to end mass incarceration too. Sure. But sometimes people think that a lie will set you free and right. a lie usually won't set you free. If I thought lies would set you free, I'd make history a bunch of lies if I thought it would work. OK, mm-hmm. but I don't think a lie will set you free. Spe- speaking of that, you wrote an article for we're, we're going to come back to South Carolina, 1866 in just a second, because that when we had dinner, mm-hmm. you said something that really made me think. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you you wrote an article that was picked up by uh, 
History News Network. And I want to flip okay. over to that. Uh, Daryl Michael Scott, Bad History and Worse Social Science Have Replaced Truth. And in this article, you talk about the origins of the uh, 13th Amendment myth. And you mentioned um, a man by the name of Lee Wood in the yeah. 1960s in California. OK, talk, yeah. talk about this and, and how this 13th Amendment uh, mass incarceration myth uh, came into existence. Yeah. So the brother, and by the way, you know, I, you know, background on this. I was being talked about on a radio show and when Lee, when Lee Wood was on it, by the way, because the okay. guy was going at me because as an anti 13th, this was the early days of when I discovered this. Right. So okay. now, now what were the early days? About what? what about, um, about, about, about the time I met, maybe six months before we met in. in, in oh, OK. You're talking so, about 2020. OK. Yeah, 20, I'm talking about 20, 2019, 2020. 2020. That's right. Okay. So this, but so, you know, I've been I've been upset about the 13th stuff for, for ever since DuVernay's uh, came out. But anyway, so but then I decided I was going to do something about it, write about it, but uh, research and write about it. But what happens is that Lee Wood is in California a, okay. in prison. And he the way he tells the story is that he was sitting around with other prisoners who were left prisoners. They were the left revolutionaries. And he believed that. When they were reading the Constitution and he read the 13th Amendment and had an epiphany. And he thought what he read in the 13th Amendment, that loophole explained why he was in prison working. Right. Okay? That's why he's here. He was re-enslaved and put to work. Hmm. Now, he was in a California prison. And so and he didn't get out until some years later. But he told his brother about this. And he says his brother goes out. And he wants his brother to tell Angela Davis and Angela Davis gets told this. But I don't know if that's where Angela Davis gets this idea from. But Angela Davis writes an article about Frederick Douglass not dealing with the issue of, of convict leasing and said, you know, critiquing him for being bourgeois and more and not concerned about the plight of, of black prisoners. Right. And so and in this, she mentions the 13th Amendment and its loophole. And so in that 1994 article just blows up. OK, and so this goes from kind of prison thought in prison movement circles into something that becomes fully academic because this, you know, the, the kind of bridge between the activist world and the academy is no better embodied than by Angela Davis, right? right and so right. Angela Davis uses this this notion in a in an article. It doesn't become her central way of understanding mass incarceration because Angela Davis understands it, it is a bona fide radical and believes that political economy and things like this is what shapes the world, right? And so her understanding of mass incarceration is not reducible to the, to the 13th Amendment, but her passing phrase is what kind of uh, catapults this into the academy, the discourse in the academy, in the same way that Lee Wood's activism, okay, put it in prison activist circles. And so prison activists throughout the 60s and 70s uh, into the 80s and 90s have latched on to the notion that the 13th Amendment is why they are incarcerated and forced to work. So in other words, it's got this two tracks. One ends up being academic. One ends up being the prison activist. OK. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is how. It, and, and by the way, a lot of stuff comes out of the 60s and it churns and churns and churns. And then sometimes it gets to be something that blows up big. Right. And so an idea that comes out of the late 60s and early 70s becomes the basis for our politics about abolition and other things by the 2010s and, and so forth. So it's kind of a fascinating story. Right. It snowballs. How, that's right. How this snowballs and grows. Right. And, and, and so that in and of itself is fascinating as an intellectual historian. Right. So so this. So you trace the 13th Amendment mass incarceration myth, the link between the two. Mm -hmm. You trace that back to uh, an incarcerated activist named Lee Wood in the 1960s in California. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. That's interesting. <laughs> and see, once again, 
<laughs> the, the, um, I, I back in 2016 when uh, Harper's Bazaar Weekly had their uh, cover story. It was, I think, April 2016. They had their cover story called "Legalize It All," mm -hmm. and it was about the history of the war on drugs and Richard Nixon's war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the journalist Dan Baum, B A U M, mm -hmm. uh, talked about an interview he did with John Ehrlichman. Uh, years before, who was who was uh, Richard Nixon's domestic policy advisor, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Ehrlichman uh, went to prison for eighteen months, uh, federal prison for his involvement in the Watergate scandal. And uh, Dan Baum said that uh, John Ehrlichman told him that the war on drugs was a war on two populations. It was a war of the um, Richard Nixon's war on drugs. Richard Nixon declared mm -hmm. his war on drugs June seventeenth, nineteen seventy one. He said mm -hmm. it was a war on the anti-war effort, the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement, mm -hmm. the hippies, mm -hmm. things like this. And it was a war in the African-American community. And he said they associated heroin with the African-American community. They associated marijuana with the anti-war movement. And mm -hmm. he said by doing this, they said, you know, you could uh, um, you could uh, uh, target their organizations. You can run these news stories about them on the news. You can incarcerate them, things like this. And so I, I was dealing, I, I was studying like the whole history of the war on drugs and drug laws going back to the uh, 1875 anti-opium laws in California mm -hmm. targeting Chinese men working on the railroads. And once again, the question I kept coming up with, because I, I saw Ava DuVernay's movie that came out in 2016, and I kept hearing, even even before that, you know, Michelle Alexander and the new Jim Crow. She has two explanations, right? It's at once the new Jim Crow, and it's once it's nineteen. She's a thirteenther and mm -hmm. a, a, a segregation. She has both metaphors at work, right? Okay, and the new Jim Crow. Yeah, see, see, and 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 Michelle Alexander, and I read her book as well, and you know, it, it, she, she pushed this as well. Mm -hmm. And then the question I kept coming back to, and this is what we talked about when we had dinner in 2020, if the 13th Amendment was created to re-enslave the former slaves, re-enslave African-Americans, mm -hmm. and create this mass incarceration, what have you, why did it take 106 years for mass incarceration to start? Because it was nobody's intention. Exactly. Exactly. It was nobody's intention. Now, you talked about South Carolina in 1866, and you talked I know, about when I we had. I know what you're about to mention. Yeah, you're talking when about. When we had dinner, you, South Carolina, and they didn't have a, a state prison until 1860. Prison. Talk about that. Yeah, well, again, in the South, you know, a lot of people didn't believe in spending money on prisons. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you know, as I tell my students, they'll, they'll, they'll convict you of a crime. 100 something odd crimes and then take you out back within a week and do you up mm -hmm. in other words they'll put you to death mm -hmm. you know putting people to death without all these you know you know supreme court wasn't big into intervening in, in, in when someone should die how they should die and all this kind of stuff in the 19th century and so what they do in south carolina if they had reason to put you to death they just put you to death and they had a lot of crimes they put you to death for and that's a lot cheaper than a prison Right. OK. And those people were they didn't believe in a the state. They didn't believe in high taxation. OK. <laughs> so, you know, prison and, 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 so now South Carolina was the first state to secede from the Union. December yeah, 1860. Yeah, and right. this is where the Civil War started. That's right. In that's, right. So, that's right. And so they started discussing at the same time that they started discussing the black codes. Mm -hmm. They started discussing a prison. Now, when you're discussing a prison, by the way, you're not discussing convict leasing. Okay, right. Because convict leasing, as we know it, is when you're selling people to private owners who, are, I mean, entities that are going to take you out to work in a field or in a right. in, in a mine or on a road or something like, like this. Corporations, or, things that's like right. that. Yeah. So you're going to, you know, let the people take control of. So when you build a prison particularly at this moment, the whole idea was that you were going to house these people. And they said right. that you're going to emancipate these Negroes and now they're going to commit more crimes because they have been criminals all along. By the way, this whole notion that black criminality was something that comes in after the Civil War, 
the notion that blacks were criminals is an antebellum notion that goes back all the way, right? Right, and before the Civil War, antebellum, oh, before the Civil War. Oh, yeah, before the Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. And so it just becomes a scientific discourse about criminality in the late 19th century, but nobody ever needs science to call somebody else criminal, right? You didn't need science for that. So they've been calling black people criminals all along. And so they were saying that black people would be free and there would be more criminals. And then they got together and said, we're going to have to build a prison to deal with this black criminality. They built a prison to hold 100 people. There were over 400,000 black people who were in slavery in South Carolina. And they built a prison that would have 100 people. Right. OK. Nobody's thinking mass incarceration. Right. Nobody. 1866. 1866. You have the Civil War about re-enslaving 400,000 people. Right. This is utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. OK. And it plays on the fact that, yeah, you can. Yeah. We think they're criminals. We need a prison. Well, how many are you going to have? You got 400,000 black people who are about to be free. How many criminals you think you're going to have? How big is your prison going to be? We'll have a, a hundred cells. <laughs> okay. So, no, they're not thinking mass. When they said the Negro was more criminal, they meant relative to whites, and they didn't need a prison for whites. And when the whites got out of control, they just put them down. They needed for the free blacks, not that they're going to have more of them. Mm -hmm. Right. And how many do you need? A hundred. Yep. They had a hundred <laughs> beds, a hundred cells. 100 cells. 1866, <laughs> South Carolina. They're going to exactly. build 100 cells. This just goes to tell you there's nobody's mind that they're going to re enslave 90% or 100% of black people. Okay, mm. it's just, this is just mythology gone mad because we think, watch this, we think that if we can draw the link between slavery and mass incarceration, we can convince white people that slavery is existing and it's evil and white people, they agree slavery is evil. Let me tell you something. That assumption is not even a good assumption. Okay. <laughs> if, you put, if, if you put the 13th Amendment to a vote today, I don't think you, I, I think you get the same 57% of white folks who think black people need, to, it's okay for police to shoot black people. You get the same 57%. Who, who well, you know, brother, in, uh, <laughs> on my show yesterday, I talked about the attack on critical race theory and the attack uh, that Mitch McConnell and other Republicans are doing on the 1619 Project. And we talked about in the Tennessee state legislature, uh, State Representative Jeff Lafferty misunderstands the, the three-fifths compromise and, the, and said the three-fifths compromise was something good, three-fifths compromise 1787. You have some very, very ignorant people in these state legislatures and the U.S. House of Representatives and U.S. Senate, very ignorant of history. And look, this is extremely dangerous. Look, look, let me tell you something. We got some black people who wouldn't mind bringing the 13th Amendment back if you got rid of laws for gay marriage. Mm-hmm. We got all kind of people out here. <laughs> we live in interesting times. <laughs> right, exactly. So, um, so don't, don't put nothing up for the vote, but don't assume, like my whole point is don't assume that anybody thinks that mass incarceration is wrong because it's mm -hmm. like slavery. And that's right, the right. Point. Nobody thinks that. That, that, is, that is not a winning argument. Right. Um, you wanted to talk about the black codes. You mentioned yeah, the black code. You know, you know the, the biggest device in thir in the thir you know thirteenth is a has to be understood as a theory that's trying to hook a person into a narrative, right? Mm -hmm. in, in 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 a kind of conspiracy theory way, and so then you gotta have the this the, gotta have this proof that people are trying to re-enslave black people. So the way you do it is, of course, you say there's a loophole in the thirteenth. So that's the first device that they point to that loophole. Right, and right. then the second device they point to is the black code. And so mm -hmm. the black code was created to re-enslave black people. That was the mechanism. So in that narrative, in that myth, the, in conspiracy theory, the Northerners, who had just beat the Southerners in a war, mm -hmm. right? right? Right. Okay, half a million people dead, okay? But they're in cahoots in the 13th of narrative to re-enslave black people. Okay, mm 
You know, that's that that's a conspiracy between the white man, north and south. OK, right, so right. now they come up with the black codes and you get celebrated people talking about these black codes as if that's how the, they're re-enslaving us. The black codes don't last a year in most places because the 1866 Civil Rights Act is striking them down. The Freedmen's Bureau is striking it down. The 14th Amendment strikes them down. A right, Supreme right. Court decision by Salmon Chase strikes it down. So the black codes are wore out, okay? Before the first convict lease system starts. Mm -hmm. If I'm dead, I can't give birth to you, okay? If So the black codes have nothing to do with convict leasing. And so this big myth, so you go from the loophole to the black codes to mass incarceration through the convict lease system, okay? And the truth of the matter is, as we talked about, fewer than 1% of black people are in the system. Now, by the way, and let's just be clear, you okay. want no part of a convict lease system. Sure. sure. Okay, the convict lease system was a death trap quite often for people, okay? Right. Many went in. And most did not get out. You, it, it could be a death sentence. And so it, nobody wants it. Now, another thing about that system that people need to know is that it was brought down much sooner than these people would let you think. You know, they right. like to say Alabama 18, 1928 is the, you know, when it ends. But 1913, it's over for the convict lease system everywhere but Florida and Alabama. OK, so the system is broken by then. And interestingly enough, the system is broken by who? The generation of white nationalists who brought you disenfranchisement and segregation. So the people who are the diehard white nationalists in the South ended convict leasing. Now, this was not philanthropic. Right. OK. I mean, let's, ne get, let's never get any of this stuff twisted, right? This is not about the morality of white people. This, in this particular case, this is about white people being at odds among themselves again about who was going to be in power. Okay? And so then you had one generation of people who thought that the laws were working for the rich white people of the South against another generation that was populist, talking about the small white man, people like <laughs> like uh, Pitchfork Ben Tillman. <laughs> oh, yeah, Pitchfork, Pitchfork ben, ben Tillman, yep. You know, Pitchfork Ben Tillman, and Pitchfork Ben Tillman, oh, by the way, and there's always US black Standard. people. There's always, at this point, he's the governor, but there's okay. always black people who agree with these kind of people about a lot of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so Pitchfork is wants to end uh convict lease, but he also wants to end black voting. And just like you got these Trumpers today who are playing with getting disenfranchised in black people by, by rolling with Trump, okay? Right. Okay, there were some black people who rolled with Bit Pitchfork and said black people should be disenfranchised. Okay, there were black Tillmanites. And so you got in there, you know, throughout the South and throughout South Carolina, they were black folks who were Democratic Party in, in Alabama. And so some of these people were all for it. And what they would have told you is that, you know, these same people were against things like convict leasing. So it's always complicated, but folks who are sometimes agreeing on, 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 on some issues find themselves in bed with the hardcore white nationalists. Right, right. <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of Pitchfork Ben Tillman, people can read this article. Uh, there's an article from Slate.com from a few years ago. It was uh, regarding, it's February 2017, it's regarding Senator Elizabeth Warren. And when Senator, Senator Elizabeth Warren was uh, silenced in the uh, U.S. Senate, and it ties into Pitchfork being Tillman, rule used to silence Warren, uh, mm -hmm. rule used to silence Warren, um was created to protect delicate feelings of senate's foremost lynching advocate and it talks about senator uh pitchfork ben tillman oh, pitchfork. Who, advoc who advocated for the lynching 
of African Americans from the U.S. Senate floor. Okay, so uh, what were yeah. you saying? What were you saying, Doctor? Yeah, 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 yeah. Strange bedfellows. Strange bedfellows. Just like I said, there's a lot of people uh, back then, black people, not most, just some. Mm -hmm. Who were rolling with pitchfork Ben Tillman, even though he would support lynching, even though he would do blah blah blah. And by the way, goes to show you you can be against convict leasing and for lynching. You mm -hmm. see how that works? And because right. you were against convict, he was against convict leasing. I want to just make clear, because he thought the money was keeping his enemies in power, because convict leasing was always corrupt. Right. And so the politicians in office would get the money from the people with the con with the lease. And that's how they would get reelected. And so part of the reform was to get rid of their enemies. Their, you know, white folks have their divisions. You always want divisions among people who are your enemies. You, you want to create them, you want to divide them, and they were they were divided on this on these issues. And this is how we get rid of convict leasing, even though nobody was for this was no moral reform on behalf of the Negro. Okay. Um <laughs> All right, I, I want to switch gears here and uh, talk about uh, for a few minutes the 1619 project. I know you've been critical of it. Uh, before we segue into that, very quick, I want to give you an opportunity to promote your latest books and promote your work so people can support you. But also, people, <laughs> you can support the African History Network because yeah. we definitely need your support as well. Uh, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This helps us to, because I, I do radio six nights a week, so this helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, I also uh, teach an online course, a nine week online course that you can register for as well. Uh, Dr. Daryl Scott, how can people purchase your books? How can people support? Well, you? I mean, you can never find anything on Amazon. But look, what I really need people to do, you know, because I'm not good at self-promotion. Go, <laughs> go join a solid. Go to A-S-A-L-H dot org. Right. And okay. join a solid. Keep Woodson's organization alive and get it back to publishing his own books. Right. In his own journal. So I won't go to yep. Well, yeah, uh, your 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 website is uh DarylMichaelScott.com. Daryl Michael Scott Daryl Michael Scott dot com. We'll bring that up. And it is Daryl with one R. One Daryl Michael yeah, Daryl Michael Scott. From Maryland, not Ohio. From Maryland, not Ohio. Yep. Daryl Daryl Michael Scott dot com. Mm -hmm. Support uh Dr. Scott. And you have a book on Dr. Carter G. Woodson as well. Yeah. What's the name, what's the name of the book? Uh, Carter G. Woodson's Appeal, uh, and then I edited uh, The Miseducation and Million Versions of that, but support the Asala version, right? Support oh, Miseducation of the Negro, 1933, yep, originally. Yeah, originally. Okay, so, um, before we go to 1619 Project, I just want to hit on something. You talked about Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Jefferson wanting to end slavery. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that ending? Now, I know Thomas Jefferson, I know at the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, there was a debate over uh, ending the, trans the, the international transatlantic slave trade, the importation of Africans uh, and enslaving them. And Thomas Jefferson wanted to abolish the international transatlantic slave trade because he felt, because we know he was a big slave owner, and he felt by cutting off the supply of Africans coming into the country, this would then increase the value of the Africans who were already here. Now, you're saying that he also wanted to end chattel slavery as well? Well, I mean, well, I mean, come on, let's, let's just be honest, right? I mean, let's think all these things through, right? Okay. You, you may, <laughs> you, you know, if, if Thomas Jefferson and these folks wanted to drive up the price of slaves, mm -hmm. they would be driving up the price of slaves against themselves too, okay? All uh, right, and then they would also drive up the cost of maintaining slaves. In other words, you now got to feed them better, treat them better, <laughs> because okay, yeah. I mean, so there's them healthy lot. because you're you're selling, you're going to sell them for a higher price. Yeah, but but again, I mean, this is not really. I mean, you got to understand a lot of this stuff. But when you're in the late 18th century. You don't have the cotton gin until towards the end, and nobody knows what the About cotton gin is going around. Seventeen ninety three. Yeah. So, so you you don't know 
what cotton is going to do and how it's going to change. Cotton growth, the, the cotton culture in America was what they used to call long, what well, they still call long staple cotton. And it was done primarily during the root revolutionary era in, in South Carolina on the sea islands primarily. So what we're really dealing with when you talk about slavery at this point in time is tobacco slavery. Okay, you don't even have a Western market for slaves at this point in time. In other words, we end up with this great migration of, 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 of slaves to the Southwest. Remember, yeah. Thomas Jefferson is the one who's trying to prevent the movement of slaves first to the Southwest. So he's a, he puts a bill for in, in 1785, trying to end the movement, you know, to end slavery in what becomes Georgia and what becomes Alabama. I mean, excuse me, not Georgia, what, become, uh, what becomes Alabama and Mississippi. He's trying to end that. He doesn't see slavery. He doesn't. And then when they do all this, they don't even have Louisiana. And so at this point, in time, right, right. He's 1803 not, Louisiana purchase. And so, and so then you don't, he's not out here trying to perpetuate slavery. He thinks he wants it to come to an end. OK, and he's and, and he wants the black folks who are here to be colonized abroad. So you would free the Negro and you would colonize him elsewhere. Get rid of him. white nationalism, baby. That's real white nationalism. All right. And so he wants them gone. Right. All right? So so this whole notion that he's doing it to increase his value. Is like, oh, no, no, no. I mean, it, it sounds reasonable enough. But there's no evidence to really sustain that, particularly when they pass these, you know, this this law right during the Constitutional Convention and agreed to end to end uh, the slave trade. OK, well, they put the 20 year clause. In yeah, the, yeah, yeah. That's Article one, yeah, section yeah, nine, yeah. clause one, that's, the 20 year clause. That's right. And so <laughs> when they make this deal, this is pre cotton. Right. This is. And at the same time, he's trying to end. Slavery in the South, I mean, that stop slavery from expanding. And so, you know, again, I, I don't have any vested interest in any of the morality of any of these cats. That's not ever what I'm talking about. I don't think history is a morality play. But right. I am trying to say that when Jefferson is dealing with black folks, okay, not only is he a hypocrite most everywhere you turn, he's also really wants a country that is made up of Americans and assimilative Native Americans, okay, who amalgamate with white folks. And he has no place for the Negro at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's his dream world. He and Richard Spencer, yeah, you, you get me? They, they right. see the same vision, you know, ethno-racial state. Right. Okay, where he incorporates Native Americans. Of Richard course, Spencer coined the term the alt-right. Yeah, he, he coined yeah. that term, but he also, the, you know, he's big on the ethno-racial state. Right, right. And he was the mentor to uh, Stephen Miller, that's who right. was in the Trump administration, advising and the, the Trump administration. And the vision is no more Negroes in the United States. Right. No okay. more black folks. No more black folks. Exactly. And so that's, I mean, so no, I'm not trying to sugarcoat old Tom Jefferson at all. Right. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Okay. Not at all. I just let the I want the cars to fall where they may so we could deal with people for what they were trying to do. Now, of course, most of my career, I've been getting slammed about calling Thomas Jefferson a white nationalist. People were saying, no, he's not a white nationalist. He wanted to create black people, a place for black people abroad. He was actually a black nationalist. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what a Yale historian said. Right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Uh, now, the 1619 Project, I, I know uh, you've been very critical of some aspects of the uh, 1619 Project from the New York Times, spearheaded by journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. Um, you And we know that um, there has been a slight um, correction <laughs> that the 1619 Project uh put out as well i'm gonna bring that up that was uh well, I, don't know back to, I don't know yeah. which version you're looking at you know that was like uh watching somebody like you in detroit right what was the what was that running back that y'all had that famous running back barry barry sanders well we have barry sanders we have billy sims before that uh, yeah but it's like watching barry sanders run down the field you know you, you diving that stuff and it's moving <laughs> you know, <so> you, <laughs> i don't know well, I don't know where they're at right now, but they're moving down the field. <laughs> right. So um, there was a well, first of all, I know you you had posted um, 
uh, it went back in September 2020. You posted uh, on your Facebook page and you laid out uh, five yeah. criticisms <laughs> of uh, the 1619 project. One was ra racism did not begin in 1619. Uh, to uh, because they're saying okay, racism began in 1619, and the 1619 project also is an attempt to reframe American history, uh, and and looking at 1619 as the beginning of uh, this country as well, beginning of the start of this country. Uh, you talk about slavery was not a primary cause of the American Revolution, uh, because this is something they had to backtrack from, um. And then uh, three, African-American history is not the story of racism and victimhood or actual his our actual history is ignored. Four, mass incarceration did not arise from the 13th Amendment. We've already dealt with that. Mm -hmm. And five, American history is not reducible to race and racism. OK, so these are five things that you laid out. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. And is the 16 that can we correct? certain things in the 1619 so it's valuable what, what, what's your opinion on this you know one of the most unfortunate things is that anytime anytime history gets to be get caught gets caught up in politics mm -hmm. everybody feels the need to run to protect the people left or center right okay we're not gonna we're not gonna side with with the people who are conservative Okay. And what we find ourselves with is a set of counter myths, right? Okay. We find ourselves with American exceptionalism coming out of the conservatives, which by the way, had its origins in liberalism. And then we find our myth, new myth, that America is reducible to the question of slavery and race, right? And that in this whole thing, not just America is reducible, that black people in our history is reducible to America, is reducible to slavery, is reducible to victimhood. So this is what the project is pretty much putting forward. And, you know, I see this as part of what I call neo-integrationism, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people like to see something militant and radical in all this, but what you're looking for is a, a people who are so upset with the, the gap between American exceptionalism and reality that they want to hold white folks, and it's black, it works with other folks, want to hold white folks so accountable that they are willing to say that we are the center of the experience. You cannot talk about this country unless you talk about how you've oppressed us. Okay. And that our oppression is more important than anything else that happened here. In fact, it's more important than anything we ever did for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so then this is... 1619 is really the mythical origins of the African American. Okay, that's what it really is. And black scholars have for over a hundred years looked, and by the way, you know, black people have been writing history about themselves ever since the 19th century. And so ever since the 19th century, black folks in the North were literate and writing about their past. And part of what they were writing about is their origins and their origins they saw as being in Virginia. So the Negro race in America was the story that started with 1619. You know, this is why Lerone Bennett, some year, you know, centuries, some years, centuries later, writes before the Mayflower. He right. said that well, this, we talked the, about that book. Yep. this is the origins of our story, our mm -hmm. story. And this story includes slavery. Oh, this story includes racism, but this story also includes our coming together as a people and making peoplehood. It includes our understanding of ourselves as Africans, and not just in, in, in America and in the world. It's the story of how we reconnect with Africa. It's the story of how we create our own literary traditions. It's the story of how we strive against all these things and, 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 and become the vanguard of women's rights, become the vanguard of civil rights. So it's a story of how we make a world out of oppression, okay? Right. And like Ralph Ellison used to say, you can't reduce us to our victimhood, okay? 
that we're not just something that people that, that, that we're not just a group of people that things happen to. We made culture. And so 1619 was and should have been and was for most of the year in most places a, a time for black folks to think back to the experience that they have as a people in America. And so for most of the year, organizations like Asala, organizations and other organizations where they were thinking about and studying 1619, the big debate was before the 1619 project was, well, should we just be plain old African-Americans? That sounds like American exceptionalism. Or should we be more African-centered and talk about the Africans in North America? Or should we say this is just a bump on the road of in the history of slavery or the bump on the road in the history of African people in the world? So these were the debates about black that black people were having. Then all of a sudden, okay, the New York Times comes out with this New York Times magazine. Now, I'm going to tell you, black people love themselves some stuff that comes out of New York City. Okay. <laughs> they love themselves from stuff that comes out of New York Times. Everybody wants right. to be so. So many people want to be in the New York Times. They live to have an article there. They live to be quoted there. They live to 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 be in Broadway. You mm -hmm. live to you know you make your career among Black folks by being celebrated in New York. Okay. Right. All right. You're right. nobody. Unless you're in the village, you're nobody in Harlem unless you've been to the village. You know how we do this stuff, right? Right. And so then everybody's excited. Everybody who had criticisms of 1619 all of a sudden was celebrating the New York Times treatment of black people, even though black people were being reduced to victims. Mm -hmm. And just simple victims of racism. But we kind of live in that age. It's not just the neo integrationists doing this. We got a, all of our so-called black nationalists are doing it, too, because we think if we can lay open our wounds, we, 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 we can get reparations. We live in an age of white supremacy that's gone wild. And we think they're going to give us reparations if we can demonstrate how pathological we are because of what they've done to us. And so the victimhood on all sides is everywhere. So that's why some people who are even not in the 1619 as the New York Times project can identify with it because it reduces American history to race and racism. Because and that helps us. That helps us with our goal for reparations. The same people who don't care about mass incarceration are supposed to be paying out reparations next week. Right. And, and we're going to we're going to parade our wounds around here like we have no pride, buck breaking and all this kind of stuff, because we think somehow saying that we have been abused is somehow serving our cause of, of, of liberation and reparations. Mm -hmm. OK, so New York Times uh, 1619 part project is part of a broader cultural problem that we have at this moment in black life history and culture. OK, I don't right. know how we got here because the black studies started arguing against pathology. Mm. Talk, talk about that for a minute, because, see, the, the, we know that there's pain in mm -hmm. our history in this country mm -hmm. but there's a, a there's a lot of perseverance and a lot of excellence as well in, inventors biologists ernest uh ernest just uh uh dr carter g dr carter g woodson dr george washington carver dr w while we have intellectual we we have everything we have madam mm -hmm. cj walker mm -hmm. we have andy turnbull malone we have john h johnson a absolutely absolutely we have every we have every from this that's end right, that's to right. this end that's right that's right everybody the same people who want to talk to you about black wall street mm -hmm. don't want to recognize that black wall street was the product of people who were allegedly pathological slaves but talk, uh, talk about that because I've done lectures on the history of Black Wall Street. And I <laughs> read I'm Hannibal saying. B. Johnson's book. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I read yeah, yeah, yeah. Han Hannibal Thomas and Hannibal B. Thomas. Yeah, do Hannibal yeah. B. Johnson's book on Black Wall Street. Hannibal oh, 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 okay, okay. Hannibal B. Yeah, Hannibal B. Okay. Johnson. Another uh, Hannibal. I thought you were talking about that other Hannibal at the turn of the century. Okay. No, but, no, no. This one here by Hannibal B. Johnson, Black Ooh, Wall Street yeah, from right. Ride that's to that's Renaissance and Tulsa's Historic Greenwood now. District. Yeah. <laughs> Ex this is probably one of the best books on the history of Black Wall Street, okay. and he deals with the fact that one of the 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 biggest 
thing that people miss about Black Wall Street is we rebuilt it with our own dollars once the race massacre happened. happened. And, but, That's but, what people leave out. Because we they focus it. on the fact that it was destroyed. Okay? Right. And they say, we can't have nothing. We rebuilt it with our own dollars. Exactly. Black folks have never been we have been oppressed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who's going to deny that? Racism has been here in one form or another once it became a justification for slavery. It's no doubt about that. No one who's going to dispute that. Nobody. Okay. Now, despite racism, we were not so oppressed that we didn't procreate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You know, you know, if you really get oppressed, you know, and, and some theories have said we've been so oppressed that it's hard to understand how we copulate. All right. Mm -hmm. So black people, despite our oppression, our population has continuously grown. <laughs> OK, we have we came out of enslavement. We reunited our families. Well, the truth be told, we created nuclear families. OK, right. because the African families weren't nuclear families as we now see it, but we created nuclear families and extended families and so forth and so on. And we carried that through with us through, and we became a very literate people. We became an increasingly educated people. We started to accumulate property despite being in the teeth of lynching, despite being in the, the teeth of segregation. We did all of these things and within a, a four, a 40 years of emancipation. So clearly we were not so oppressed that we were dysfunctional people, okay? And the story is only half told. So even though we're oppressed, we are functioning people. We are, we, we created colleges, we created churches, we created fraternal right. organizations. We have, we have cooperatives. We have cooperatives. We have cooperatives. The Color Merchants Association, the, by the, the way, Color Farmers Union. You know, I have got have a, a former graduate student named Anton House who's writing a book on William Washington Brown, who created a cooperative in the true reformers. And we haven't even begun to understand that. You can't even understand Black Wall Street if you don't understand the true reformers, because he had a notion of collective black economic empowerment, not this individual stuff where you would own one piece of property. Right, right. He believed that black people collectively should invest in the true reformers and the true reformers would underwrite black economic development collectively. And so they had old folks home. They had uh, banks. They, they, you know, Madam, uh, not Madam CJ Walker. Uh, and the term Malone. No, no, not Malone, but the women, the Walker, the, no, 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 no. I, I fell having a brain cramp, but basically all the folks out of Richmond, Mm -hmm. Okay, the folks who end up being the origins of the middle class in Richmond and in South and in and, and, and Durham, these folks were all true reformers. Mm -hmm. Okay, almost to a person. So by the turn of the 20th century, when they start individualizing, they have all been through the true, most, so many of them have been through the true reformers. Okay, so the black insurance companies are, are really the beneficiaries of the history of the true reformers. The black bankers are the beneficiaries of the history of the true reformers. Okay, so the true reformers are really the link between the emancipated generation because these people were former slaves. Right. See, we're not talking to gen. We're talking about people who shot their masters mm -hmm. in the Civil War. You know that side of the Civil War. Right. Right. You know where we right. shoot the master. Right. Okay, so the true reformers went from being union soldiers quite often, okay, to becoming business people, okay, mm -hmm. collectively putting their resources together mm -hmm. so that they can start a bank, okay? And so when people say the Freedmen's Bureau stole black people's money and they didn't know how to save money, the true reformers were saving money and right. starting banks and teaching other people things that would lead them to start banks, okay? Pioneering insurance. And so that the people after the true reformers, they would be black insurance companies. And so all of North this- North Carolina is, Mutual Life Insurance Company, right. John Merrick. By the way, yep. Merrick is tied to the true reformers. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, so what I'm saying is that when you start looking at, at all of these folks who are in business in the late 19th century, these people didn't come from a defeated people. You can't have it both ways. You can't be so much of a victim that you can't do for yourselves and you got to waiting around, you know, and even the advocates of the reparation movement. These people were also people who were building institutions. Okay, right. so these things are taking place all at the same time. All right. But nobody ever went so far as to debase themselves. I mean, again, in the 60s, black studies start because a guy named Stanley Elkins okay. and some of the liberals started saying that we were all pathological because of oppression. And then they start critiquing the black family, saying how the family was destroyed by slavery. So black mm-hmm. studies starts with a generation of scholars that refuted the notion taken up at the Carter G. Most people don't give him credit, but he was one of the first people to go against E. Franklin Frazier, who said the black family had been destroyed by slavery. And by the way, he didn't mean it to to, to the extreme that people think he meant it, right? He thought 80% was a bad number, okay? So oh oh eighty percent uh of children had their fathers in the home like in that's right sixty he thought yeah. that was a bad number but he right. also understood that it wasn't a critical issue when you had an extended family in the rural south okay so that's why they could overstate it but Woodson didn't like that so Woodson argued that the black family was destroyed so the the first generation of black studies scholars in the late sixties they defended the black family. The first generation defended the notion that we were psychologically scarred by slavery. So black psychologists argued that we were not pathological as a result of of, of white. They argued against self-hate. So self-hate was on the defensive. The whole thing, by the way, this is my first book, Contempt and Pity. And so I, I talked about all that. So the first generation of black scholars in black studies were anti pathologists. And now we live in a day and age where everybody in black studies seems to be tending towards accepting one pathology argument or another. Mm-hmm. Okay. Epigenome and, and all this stuff where we pass along, uh, along not in the genes, but on the genes, notions of, of slavery and oppression. You mean right? like epigenetics? You mean yeah, like epigenetics. Epigenetic. And, and, and so they, you know, they, they, we pass this stuff along that way. That's one pathology argument of today. You get the other pathology arguments, you know, self-hate theories are everywhere again. Mm-hmm. All right. And, and then, you know, it, it's on and on. What, what, sure. uh, you know, bug breaking is a form of a pathology argument because the argument is, is that ritualistically we were destroyed psychologically. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, in this homophobic theory, this is why you have LBGTQ today. Mm-hmm. Okay, all this stuff is tending towards a pathology argument. All this stuff is tending to undo what the founders of black studies created. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, a lot of these people that everybody's so proud of today, I don't know, you know if whether you're in an Afrocentric camp. I don't right, think right. John Kendrick Clark would be signing on all this nonsense. Okay. Yeah, 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 I don't yeah. care <laughs> if, if if you are in the mainstream, you know, uh tradition that goes from from Henry Louis Gates on back to John Hope Franklin, these people all rejected that kind of stuff. I don't care what tradition. So, and, and by the way, the worst part about all this is that nobody seems to be reading the scholars from 40 years ago. So right, black right. scholars <laughs> are writing as if nobody's ever written about this. They don't exactly. argue with the academics who came before them uh, who, mm-hmm. who argued against them? They just ignore stuff, okay? Right, right. And this doesn't matter whether we're talking. That's why about, we have to read. That's why we have to read right. these scholars. That's, that's why we got to read. So it doesn't matter whether you know. A lot of us increasingly are just doing it by video, and it's not just the, the conscious community doing it by video, okay? Increasingly, mm-hmm. it's all the oral culture again. I mean, the academics may be writing, but they're all you know they're part of a social media culture. And so the ideas are circulating primarily that way. Okay, mm-hmm. they're not circulating primarily by text anywhere. Okay. Right. Let, me, let me ask you this. Uh, lastly, uh, we were talking about the 1619 Project, mm-hmm. and uh, I brought up uh, uh, there was an update for March 11th, 2020. And I know you posted about this on uh, Facebook. Now, this is actually from the New York Times. 
And uh, if we just look at a quick synopsis of the 1619 Project, uh, the 1619 Project is an ongoing initiative from the New York Times that began in August uh, 2019, the 400th anniversary of the beginning of American slavery. Uh, and, and we do know that the uh, uh, Spanish were taking Africans into the area that is today Georgia and South Carolina in 1526 enslaving them. We know that, but they're talking about here in the British colonies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it aims to, the 1619 Project aims to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of Black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. Okay, so that's a, a brief synopsis of the 1619 Project. So then in this uh, update here, they talk about, about uh, it starts out, uh, this is on March 11th, 2020. Uh, today we are making a clarification to a passage in an essay from the 1619 Project. Uh, the passage in question states, the passage in question states that one, that one primary reason the colonists fought the American Revolution was to protect the institution of slavery. This, is, this assertion has elicited criticism from some historians and support from others. We stand, so they go on to say, we stand behind the basic point, which is that among the various motivations <laughs> that drove uh, the Patriots toward independence was a concern that the British would seek or were already seeking to disrupt in various ways the entrance system of American slavery. Um, okay, so they, so they made they made a correction because uh, okay, let me scroll down here for the sake of time. Let me scroll down to the next paragraph. Okay, um, they, they make the correction here. Okay, we recognize that our original language could be read to suggest that protecting slavery was a primary motivation for all, all italicized, for all of the colonists. The passage has been changed. The passage has been changed to make clear that this was a primary motivation of some of the colonists, a note that has been appended to the story as well. So, so, talk, so talk about all of this and criticism, legitimate criticism, not, not, not this Mitch McConnell Republican nonsense, because they don't want really the history of slavery taught. They don't want to teach about systemic racism in school, but taught about legitimate, I, I guess we could say constructive criticism Mike, Mike, of the 1619 Mike, Project. Michael, yeah. Some black people like slavery. <laughs> some black people <laughs> like Trump. Uh huh. So I'm sure, and I know I have seen a document or two mm -hmm. where an American, a, 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 a revolutionary, white mm -hmm. revolutionary, may have been concerned about his slave because they talked about the case in Brit Britain where slavery was ended if if someone free, well, I forget the case right now, someone was free, landed on British soil, they would be free. Okay, that case brought a little conversation up, but it was not a great conversation. It was not a huge conversation that took place on this side of the water. In fact, right. when you look at all of these books that make reference to the uh, the Somerset case. When you look at all the books that make reference to the Somerset case, all they show you is a couple of documents. They don't have a world of evidence on this side of the water, period. Okay? okay. You don't have, you don't even have a discourse among loyalists, okay? About what would happen to their slaves. You know, loyalists have slaves too. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't hear discourse among so, them about it. The, the, when you talk about the loyalists, you, you, you're, you're talking about the, the you're talking about the, 
Say it again. Against the American Revolution, the people who were for the king. Yeah, right, for the king. Right. So you right. don't see a big concern among anybody mm -hmm. about slavery being at stake in this war. Okay. You know, and some of the evidence, like they point to Lord Dunsmore, who passes a, a decree that says, you know, all the slaves that run into the British lines. Let's just talk about that one second. Right. There's already a war. That's part mm -hmm. of the evidence that they use to say the cause of the war mm -hmm. was slavery. They use evidence from the war to talk about the cause of the war. Okay. Who does that? Right. All right. And so, but even when, when Dunsmore lists go this proclamation, there was already armies in South Carolina. South Carolina and Virginia already had an army mm -hmm. fight, ready to fight and having skirmishes with the British. So it didn't cause anything. And so then, but, but hey, I've been around long enough to know that I make a general statement about causation and then like your boy Barry Sanders, I put that leg out there and then I take that leg back, right? Mm -hmm. And right. then I keep on running and then I put that leg back out there like I do it all over again to you. So basically they keep moving down the field, dodging, dipping and dodging when anybody who does serious history knows slavery was not a major cause or even a minor cause worth talking about. You know, you can throw everything into the pot. Well, when you say major or minor cause, you're talking about towards the American Revolution. Yeah. Cause of the American Revolution. Of the American Revolution. Right. You, know, you can throw everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can even throw in there that some people just didn't like the king. Okay. Okay. I could right. throw that into the pot. All right. Mm -hmm. I could throw in there the fact that some people didn't like the governor. And you know, some people fought because they didn't like the governor. Okay. Right. Of their colony. I mean, so this this gets at the level of trivia when people start arguing along these lines. But why are they so invested in this? They keep doing this because they know the legitimacy has been struck. But if, by the way, this is not the only error. And like I said, the biggest error is that they reduce black people's history to questions of slavery and oppression. Okay, as if we've done nothing here for ourselves. That's the biggest error to me. Then right, they right. got and then they got the thirteenth in there. Anytime you see Brian Stevenson's in one of these projects, his mm -hmm. contribution is thirteenth ism every time. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's in that narrative. Okay, so the way they've structured this whole thing is that everything is about a, a grievance against America. And by the way, when is the last time have you seen black intellectuals think that contributionism? is a valid thing for black intellectuals to do. In other words, we all have been poking fun at the contributionist history that used to be written prior to the 1960s, okay? Contributionist okay. history. We were there, you know, Peter, you know, my boy Connor Woodson was a contributionist quite often, right? He would say, "Oh, we we were there. We we don't we we were there at the uh, when when they oh we were involved in all aspects we, of we were, history. Uh, we were the first right. ones shot in the American Revolution. We were there. Right. We were there. We were there. Ain't nothing happened in America that we didn't make. We we love our country. See, this is what's really interesting about this project, the 1619 project. It okay. sounds militant, but this is a." This is basically a complaint about the shortcomings of American exceptionalism. It is not a critique of American exceptionalism per se. It doesn't strike at the heart of American exceptionalism. Okay? It's saying that it's taking the American Constitution and basically with a tear in the eye saying, you didn't, look what you've done to me and you haven't fully accepted me and we're going to show you everything about your life is me. OK, this is about marginalization to the nth degree by people who can't be accepted enough in the American narrative. OK, oh, crap, right, right. They want acceptance in the American narrative more than they want a story that affirms their own history. Mm -hmm. OK, so the 1619 project is why, is why I call it the neo integrationist project. Okay? <laughs> I can't be accepted enough into the mainstream. Right. 
You nothing without me. This country's nothing without me. This country was founded in 1619. Like there wasn't even a founding in 1607. Right. Okay. Right. Right. And, you, and, 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 and what part of this ain't you gonna claim? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you know you've heard me say it. I consider myself a liberal American nationalist, but I don't drink no Kool Aid. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these people are effectively simply saying, "I've had the Kool Aid and I'm disillusioned." And I want you to now accept me fully. Okay? And I'll be happy. And I'll be happy. And particularly if you give me some reparations. Because now the neo integrationists and the so called black nationalists agree on one thing is that we can't even live till tomorrow if we don't get reparations. Now, I'm for reparations, but I just right. don't. In the heyday of white supremacy, because this is a neo, you know, this is a resurgence of white supremacy. I don't think you're getting reparations in the resurgence of white supremacy. I think your oppressors are back to trying to oppress you. Full well, you, you, you don't have 60 votes in the Senate. You don't you, have to the, 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 the pass any reparations bill. The, you, you, you the votes don't exist, and and requires is kept. You don't have 218 in the House of Representatives. Look, 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 you don't have the votes to get the police off our butts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> let alone take money out of somebody's pockets. And I know, I know all the arguments that say you ain't got to really use real money. I know all the arguments. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know how people make this, all these arguments. The point is white folks basically stormed the Capitol, had an insurrection. Right. Because their white nationalist president mm -hmm. got defeated mm -hmm. because of Negro and colored votes. Right. Okay. And so these folks don't want to accept an election result. Right. Right. But these are the folks that are supposed to end police oppression and give you reparations soon. Okay. You know, sometimes I think that black people believe that the people oppressing them are not oppressors. I think they think that white people are more moral than what they suggest they are. Because if you think that you're not good, you're going to get reparations without a gun in your hand mm -hmm. from the people who are trying their best to disenfranchise you, 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 must, you must know their heart better than they know their hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, or you, 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 you're going to pick up rifles and, and go get the money. Mm -hmm. You know, see, see, this is where, and, and the reason I'm bringing this up is what all of this bad history has in common, an attempt to justify reparations, okay? That, and it, and it unites black people across a lot of lines in this day and age, that they think that the white people who oppress them are much more moral than they let on. <laughs> Right. I, I don't understand it. Exactly. Because I know some of these arguments are not really for our consumption. Okay? okay. Because at bottom, do you really want your kid to just think that you are that you that you are a, a bag of pathologies again? Mm -hmm. Is this what you want your kids to think about themselves? I don't get it. Except for to say that they really think that in a movement that's gonna undo the status quo on some key issues by by parading the pathologies and making historical cases up if they have to to justify right right um give people your website again daryl michael scott dot com, dot, dot com okay mm -hmm. So with the 1619 Project, you, 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 from your perspective as a historian, you don't think it could be salvaged or corrected or correct the inaccuracies in it? Is it something that our people should read? What do you think we should do? Well, I mean, first of all, once again, we're trying to get our history from the New York Times. Okay. <laughs> right. And yet you think this country is the worst place on earth and you think at the same time the New York Times is where we should get our history? Mm -hmm. 
you know, again, I'm not, I'm the person who doesn't think it's the worst place in the world. I'm the person who believes that there's a, a hope for the future. Okay. Right, right, right. I, I'm that guy. But are we supposed to be so, are you so, the same people who think that this is racist to the core? Think the New York Times is where we should get our history? Mm -hmm. What are some good, what are some good source, what are some good sources for um, African Americans to go to get their history? Well, well, what do you recommend a few books that we should read first, to give us a foundation? Let me say this, this is a golden age of black history. Now, what do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, when you know when I was a kid in the '60s, you there were there were books, and you can kind of have your whole Black History library. Okay, look, I can't keep up with the literature. Black right. people are writing, and all kind of people are writing good histories about Black folks here, there, and everywhere, right? And so there's just so many talented, creative people out here. Right, that you can do this. Now, I typically don't. I mean, again, I don't want to go say go to one text or another. All I want to okay. simply say is be part of a process in which you read about your past, okay, in which you read and, and debate the debate what you read as opposed to debate the debaters, right? In other words, mm -hmm. you get to the point when it all becomes like it's not oral tradition, it's just YouTubian, and I, to borrow one from Umar, right? He didn't know some YouTubian players, right? And so we, right, got, right. we're at a point now that we're just taking in our history by celebrity. And I'm mm -hmm. saying, go out and read the scholars that there's no end to good history out here. There's no end to histories with footnotes where you can, you know, read these histories. I mean, you can go back to, to Vincent Harding and go forward to the sisters who are writing about black women and, and you know, and from the, I mean, American history from the eyes of black women. They're just all kind of beautiful things that are being written, okay? I mean, right. there's no dearth of anything. There's no excuse for anybody, right? I mean, that's the beauty of it to me. And I don't, and I know we all come from different camps, okay? I respect people from a lot of different uh, intellectual perspectives. That's why I don't want to give out just one perspective, okay? Okay. okay. But okay. the bottom line on all of this is that you're supposed to engage everything you read. You're not supposed to be a passive reader. And you certainly don't think that, don't reduce the past to grievance finding. Don't reduce the past to a celebration. I mean, just be critical because I actually believe more than anything else is that the past is a warehouse of our experiences. Okay. Right. And then we can learn about humanity from our experiences. We can learn about ourselves. Okay. I'm in that tradition where like Carter G. Woodson is from, where you say to know thyself is important if you're an educated person, because if you don't know yourself, then you'll become whatever people want you to become. So right. the process of, of, of self-knowledge is what I'm about. And nobody has a monopoly on that. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I, I would encourage people to read The Miseducation of the Negro by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I encourage them to read Before the Mayfly by Lerone Bennett Jr. Also, uh, Golden Age of the Moor is a fantastic book uh, yeah. edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. And you have essays from Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay and Renoko Rashidi, uh, people like that. Uh, Tony Browder is excellent as well. Uh, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, Egypt on the Potomac by Browder. Uh, there's a lot of good information. Dr. John Henry Clark's books, uh, of course, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism, uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot out here. Um, Dr. That Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, he has a book dealing with the civil rights movement. His uncle, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, is one of my teachers. I've interviewed Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. So there's a lot out here. Uh, oh, this, uh, this, it's the best of times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes uh, to black history, it is. Absolutely. Uh, visit his website, DarylMichaelScott.com. They can order your books there or, or Amazon for your they, books. They can, yeah, the, the, Amazon. Amazon. I, I, I haven't gotten a hawk in any of my own books. <laughs> right. Okay. You can order his books from Amazon. Uh, uh, and he has a book on uh, Dr. Woodson also. Uh, so well, do you teach any? Now, I know you teach at Howard University. Do you teach any classes online? So people who who don't who don't you know, attend Howard get, can take classes. You know, I thought about that, but you know that is actually a big commitment. You know, when you do. I know I teach a nine week course, man. It is a big commitment. I know it's a huge <laughs> commitment. 
and, and I do teach extra courses sometimes at Howard just to okay. help students get out of school. So, you know, so I kind of do my teaching at Howard, you know, okay. but, but having said that, you do know I'll debate anybody on social media. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, uh, look, Dr. Daryl Scott is it, it, it's great to have you mm -hmm. on. And, uh, we haven't been able to really, really talk since uh, we had dinner together with uh, Jamon Jordan and Asala uh, back in February 2020. So uh, I, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. This is a wealth of knowledge. I think people really, really learned a lot today and learned a lot about history. All right. Thanks. All right, brother. Take care. Take care now. Bye. All right. Take care. Peace. All right, everybody. That's Dr. Daryl Scott, a uh, history professor at uh, Howard University. Uh, so want to remind you that uh, the African History Network show we're on, because uh, I'll be broadcasting tonight. We're on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. Uh, 11 p.m. is kind of late to have them on, and we had an extended session because uh, my radio show is on only for an hour, and I want people to actually see him so they can really interact with us more. So we'll share some excerpts of this interview on my nightly radio show. And then we're on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if you'd like this time for information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, if you support through Cash App, be sure to type in dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. It'll show my name. It'll say Michael and show my picture there. This helps us to keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting six days a week. I also teach a nine-week, 18-hour uh, online course, a nine-week online course that uh, uh, meets on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So our next class is Saturday, May 8th, um, and we, this is session number two. So all we do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch them over and over again, okay? So as soon as you register, you'll be able to watch class number one, and then also I taught the course in February, and um, uh, February and March, because we kicked it off in African American History Month. When I taught it in February uh, 2021, um, that was the first time I taught the class since 2019. Okay, so there's a lot more information I've incorporated. We have new discoveries, new archaeological discoveries taking place all the time. So uh, if you go to our website, we just I just posted the link here for the online course, but also if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com uh, is right on the home page. So if you uh, scroll down the home page, as information here for my radio show. Uh, you can listen to audio podcasts here, but you can listen live, uh, watch on face our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. You can watch the show live and then also download the iHeartRadio app. And you can listen to the iHeartRadio app as well. You can read articles I've written here. Uh, this is the information for the online course. We have the flyer here as well. Uh, and then just click right here. It says register here, takes you to the next page, click here to enroll. So it's regularly $130 on sale, $80. Um, we do the classes live. You can ask questions in class also with the, uh, text chat. You can ask questions in class, but all the sessions are recorded as well. Okay. All the sessions are recorded and, um, you can watch from around the world, okay? And you still have access to the class even after, um, you know, the whole course is over with. You can still, you'll still have access to the uh, course content. So that's ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start in 1441 with the Portuguese going into Mauritania. We can't start in 1619 uh, in Virginia. We have to deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. We deal with Nubia, ta Um, And then also we deal with the ancient African presence in the Americas. This is one of the books I use in the class. Dr. From Dr. David M. Hotel is the author. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence. And he deals with the African presence 
in the Americas going back at least 56,000 years ago in South America, at least 51,700 years ago here in the land we call the United States of America. He deals with the Khoisan who come from Southern Africa, have the oldest DNA on the planet. And um, they, they were here in South Carolina. They were throughout this land as well. During, you know, they built pyramid mounds, they built the mounds and all of the types of things like this. So we deal with this history. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, who take the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And this is going to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And then we deal with what leads to the transatlantic slave trade taking place also, okay? So that's ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. It's an online course that I teach on Saturdays, 12 noon, the 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can um, register for that. As soon as you register, you can start watching uh, the content. All right, well, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you later. Peace.